So at this point, we're going to switch over to uh, Jeremiah. He's going to uh, talk about what uh, Brown and Newtone and Vinmar, all those are now a collective body and what they're doing and how to do the best installs. I'll prompt him with a couple of questions. And um, so if you want to, Jeremiah, go ahead and grab the screen yourself. And uh, I'll try and answer uh, questions in the background, and then we'll switch back. I'll do some uh, – uh, other parts of this, and uh, he can answer some questions. So if you have anything that you think is a good idea, suggestion, or something, shoot it out there, and we'll make sure Jeremiah gets a copy. All right. Is everybody seeing my screen now? Can you uh, see it? Uh, they, they probably look the same, so go ahead and uh, okay. go to your next slide. Right. There we go. All right. So uh, thank you, Joe, for uh, for that. Um, my name is Jeremiah Bollinger with Brown & Newtone. I'm the uh, Midwest Area Sales Manager. I currently reside in Chicago, Illinois. Um, Joe has asked me uh, to be a part of this uh, webinar and share uh, you know, what I know about ventilation. And I've been with Brown & Newtone for four and a half years now. And uh, with my time with Brown & Newtone, I've been focusing on building science, indoor air quality, where are we going as a country. Um, and as most of you know, you know our journey is heading towards you know net zero uh, energy by uh, 2020. Uh, so I've been trying to uh, to learn all I can about uh, the ventilation side of of our goals uh, to get to uh, to net zero. Um, my involvement currently, um, I'm actually our lead contact for EBA, Energy Environmental Building Alliance, and then I also have other involvement with net professionals, BPI professionals. Uh, home builders that are uh, seeking their uh, Energy Star certifications or uh, the EPA's Indoor Air Plus certifications. Uh, I also am uh, part of the uh, Chicago chapter uh, for Passive House. Attend a lot of their uh, their uh, monthly meetings and walk house walk through houses that they're working on uh, in in Chicago. So as a lot of you guys are experiencing, you know the codes, the building codes are, are changing along with the energy codes. Um, They've changed a lot over the past four years, especially uh, with the IECC 2012 and 2015 codes uh, being adopted. And some of the ventilation uh, sides of those codes involve uh, bathroom spot ventilation, where now there's a minimum 50 CFMs uh, for, for bathrooms, uh, as well as there may be uh, verification required, depending on um, if that... Uh, that fan meets specific requirements, and I'll go through that a little bit later you know, in, a, in a later slide. And then also, as we start building tighter and tighter houses, uh, we we need to focus on whole hole mechanical ventilation, and ASHRAE has their standards uh, that we will be reviewing today. And then also another part of ventilation is range hoods, uh, being the typically the largest exhausting appliance in in, in the house. Uh, we need to figure out a way how to uh, provide makeup air uh, to that home so we don't depressurize that uh, that house uh, too much. So there's codes out there now that uh, focuses on that, uh, where if you have a, uh, a range of over 400 CFMs, you are required to provide a one-for-one -one, um, makeup air, and we have uh, some strategies that I'll, I'll go through that as well. So basically, my my understanding is that this is what we are shooting for. This is what we're wanting. We're we're wanting a really nice, tight house, uh, basically a house wrapped in plastic. You know, uh, not literally, but that's uh, you know figuratively. So we want this really, really tight house, but yet we have to live in there, and we want it to feel like this, to where it's a nice, fresh air, uh, you know, open, you know, free to to nature. So how we accomplish that um, in such a large country with multiple climate zones, with you know hot and humid environments, or hot and dry environments, or or cold and dry, or you know so different areas of the country that we have to provide products for or solutions uh, for the different uh, climate zones. And each zone has different strategies um, that we need to to worry about or think about or consider. And there's different products for each of those markets. 
the, it's not a, a one size fits all mentality. You know, we have to really pick and choose which products we are are trying to use in these different areas of the country, uh, and thinking of our home as an entire system. You know, as we change uh, one product or one um, um, fixture or device inside of our house or insulation or whatever. Uh, we affect everything else inside of the home. Um, so we need to make sure that we are mindful of the even the smallest of changes. Uh, it could be just caulking that could change uh, the, the entire dynamics of that house. So having, uh, having products and solutions uh, to fit the entire country and all these different codes and strategies that, uh, that we are, tr are coming across now is one of my focuses and one of the areas that I've been trying to make sure that that we as a manufacturer are providing you, you guys the right products and solutions. And your uh, mind, can I pause you for a second? Yes. So I want to ask Absolutely. folks out there, say, so compliance is a uh, hit or miss concept. I mean, we're all aware of that challenge. So for those of you that are out there, can you tell me if you're part of a new construction uh, is the majority of this discussion today is uh, is your building official or plan review person actually evaluating what kind of fan you put in, or they just assume that you know it's going to do 50 CFM um, no matter what, um, and uh, they don't really care or even look at it? So I just want to kind of get a compliance overview. If you can give me some feedback that they don't even look at it, or yes, my uh, building officials uh, do check the box or find out if it's rated for the compliance. So any feedback on that would be appreciated. Thanks. All right, thank you, Joe. I'll continue on then while you get that feedback. Um, so, um, the Home Ventilation Institute HVI, they have um, products. Uh, sorry, they have a, a standard that they are trying to put out there as to how we're going to size um, bath fans, and the the full the first bullet there kind of is a generalized. Uh, formula that they used if you have a standard eight-foot ceiling. So basically lift, uh, the length times width um, equals the, uh, the number of CFMs you, you need. Um, but as, as we all know and have experienced, construction is never a standard. There's always uh, curve balls, is always different uh, vaulted ceilings or slope ceilings or whatever there is. Uh, and we want to account for those that, that the entire volume of the bathroom. So the the second bullet here kind of tries to to accomplish that and tries to incorporate the ceiling height inside of there. So it's length times width times height times 0.13. So that kind of gets us um, more of an accurate number of what uh, how many CFMs we need for that bathroom. And then at the bottom of the slide, I've kind of done some basic math here so, and to show you how close those numbers actually are. So if we just did the 9 times 5 is 45, um, CFMs is what we would need. And as we experienced from a previous slide, the minimum now is 50 CFM, so we would just round that up to 50. And if we needed to do um, add the height in there, so... Um, 9 times 5 times 8 times 0.13 is um, 46.8 CFMs. So it's only off by 1.8 CFMs there. Um, so it's as, as you guys are walking houses and you're seeing different types of ceilings and different types of you know uh, bathrooms with volumes, um, just keep this in mind that there's two ways of trying to accomplish that. Um, the, the understanding of... Um, what CFM you need for that bathroom. Jeremiah, can you uh, explain who the uh, Home Ventilation Institute is and how they are, um, what they do for the industry um, in terms of uh, all, all manufacturers have to work with them? So I was wondering if you could explain who they are. That is correct. So uh, the Home Ventilation Institute um, was actually founded, uh, I think it's back in 1955. Um, so it's been around for only a few years. And uh, we were one of the, uh, the first manufacturers that uh, joined them and started working with them. And it's just a, an independent third-party verifier, you know, because manufacturers, yeah, we try the best that we can to 
to produce a great product and and have you know our literature you know reference that product and make sure that we are as accountable as we can be but you know sometimes uh, that's just not good enough so you know they're just an independent uh, third party that um, we submit all of our products to them for final testing and make sure that our marketing information and specs match what they are testing and what they are finding. So it's, I don't know if it's an exact requirement for all manufacturers. I know most uh, manufacturers do submit uh, for that independent third party just because they want to have that HVI certified sticker on their product so that you can say it's it's been tested, it's been verified, um, you're going to get what you're going to get. One of the things that they actually provide in the industry to uh, clarify is that they are kind of your uh, calibration um, standard. Is that one way you would describe them? Well, yeah, absolutely. When so you when you have a third independent third party, I mean they've calibrated their equipment and their tools to hit a baseline, uh, and because all the manufacturers provide our products to them for testing. Well, yeah, their calibration and their standards become the the national baseline for that product, so for all ventilation. So, if we calibrated our our equipment up at our factory different than what HVI would calibrate it at, well, obviously we we would get different uh, different outcomes, different CFMs, different zone levels, and so forth. Uh, but by having their certification, we have um, verified that our products equal out to all the other um, manufacturers that have the same certification. That was a great explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, moving on here. So uh, part of just not just sizing a bath fan and getting the right CFM, that's only one aspect of it. Um, we need to now worry about the ductwork itself. So the ductwork is, is actually even more important than the actual CFM of the fan because uh, it's, it could, it's changes per job. You know, we, it's not something that we can manufacture in a factory and cookie cutter the ductwork. The ductwork is installed based off of that house and it's so, it varies drastically how, how ductwork is installed. And airflow is um, dependent on that ductwork. So if that ductwork has turns and bends and, and so forth, well, it will speed up or slow down depending on the, that ductwork itself. So having uh, drastic sharp turns and corners uh, will cause that air to, uh, to decelerate and it will go slower through that duct. So some of the you know, most ideal ways is you know, to create a straight duct run. You know, we want it as straight as possible. Uh, we obviously understand that sometimes that's just not physically possible in you know, some of these homes that are being built. So um, there is also rigid ductwork that's out there, which is also more ideal because then it's got smooth walls that the air can flow through. Uh, air flows the best. Uh, when it's smooth and straight through that duct. Um, so having uh, a, a, a solid wall versus uh, flex duct has, you know, the, um, that little piece of metal that's, you know, kind of spiraling through there um, causes more resistance. So that can also cause the, uh, the bath fan to slow down from that 80 CFMs. And then long duct runs uh, and, you know, ducts with multiple turns, fans are, cause that fan to, uh, to work harder and uh, increase the noise. So if, if you hear of a, yeah, this bath fan is supposed to be quiet, and then you install it and all of a sudden it sounds a lot different, a lot louder. Well, it's because, it could be because the, the duct work has many turns or bends and so forth inside of there. So... The ductwork really plays a crucial role of performance that we have um, with all of our bath fans. And my next slide here kind of shows you a poor example of what happens a lot uh, out there in the field because we have multiple trades uh, installing bath fans. It's not just one trade or another in every part of the country. Uh, we have to um, find out who that trade is, who's responsible uh, for for purchasing that product and installing it. 
So in this situation here, we have, you know, I would guess the the electrician has purchased the product, this fan, and has installed it to where the the uh, the ductwork is going in the wrong direction for where the HVAC uh, needs to run it to to run the termination. So the HVAC guy doesn't, you know, touch the installation side because that's outside of his 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 work uh, requirements. So all he does is throw the duct on there and you know hoop it around and terminate it um, outside the house. So we really need to be mindful uh, of these situations and if. If any of you are, you know, inspectors or um, project superintendents, you know, definitely if you see anything like this, um, all we got to do is flip it around to the other side of the beam. Uh, you're talking probably with, if they're 16 on center or 24 on center, so it's not a huge um, move by taking that particular product and just moving it to the other side so that we can then turn that duct around and make it as, uh, as straight as possible. There are a few high-end products that we have, and I'll, uh, I'll point these out later as I, I show them, where you can, in fact, um, have this framing, this housing that will turn inside of there, so it'll point the opposite direction if need be, so if this does happen. Um, but on our uh, economy series product, which this is, um, it, uh, it doesn't have that feature where you can turn it around completely and have it face the other direction. Um, so my next slide here um, talks about kind of what I consider the ideal scenario for uh, for ventilating um, these fans with ductwork. You know, we've got this fan here, and we we need a straight run off of that fan um, in order for this fan to get up to speed. So we need about, I'm guessing, two to four feet, somewhere in there, that range um, of straight duct in order for that fan to actually hit its 80 CFMs or 110 CFMs um, easier before we make turns. And the easiest analogy that I've used over, over the years is, you know, with any sort of racing, you know, whether it's stock cars or NASCAR or, or whatever, you know, they, they, they start in the middle of a straightaway because they need to get up to speed first before they can start making their turns and carry their, their speed through those turns. And the same thing falls here in line with, with bath fans where we need to get these bath fans the best chance to get up to speed first before we start making turns. So uh, if we need to go up to a roof cap, well, we need, you know, a straight run first to get that, that fan up to speed, and then we can carry that speed through the turn. Uh, as efficiently as possible. If we're using flex duct, well, let, let's make sure that it's a gradual turn and not any sort of 90 degrees. Um, or if you are using hard pipe, well, is there a way we can use 245s versus 190? Things like that will help improve the performance of, of our product. And then also in this slide, I, I, I want to point out is um, the termination point. So there, we have uh, roof caps and wall caps um, that we manufacture also that we use with a lot of our products and you know we've been selling these things uh, like crazy you know far before I started with Broder Newtone and uh, something that's come along in the past few years are soffit vents and the soffit vent is right underneath that that eave there and as a manufacturer we could easily start manufacturing soffit vents. That would be an easy adjustment for us, but all the, the physics, the dynamics of a soffit vent kind of make us cringe a little bit because you're taking this air from a bathroom, which could have high relative humidity, and we're trying to push it outside the house. Well, in that process, we're giving that air time to dilute through a wall cap or roof cap uh, before it could potentially get sucked back up inside of that house. So inside of a, an eave or soffit there, um, we have air vents that ventilate the attic. Uh, so if we are terminating the bath fan in the soffit, we are probably within a foot or two of a potential um, vent that could, retro, you know, could actually just suck that air right back up into the attic. So 
you know, there's been situations where I've tried to explain this to builders and they're like, well, this is just the best way. Well, you're better off just saving your money than inducting it into your attic because that's essentially what you could be doing um, by terminating through that soffit. So I wanted to point that out that, you know, our position is the two really only ways to terminate uh, an exhaust fan is through a roof cap or a wall cap that allows time, allows distance from um, other air inlets, I'm going to call it. So we're going to talk about HRVs and ERVs later, but we have air inlets for those as well. So we want to make sure that you know these exhausting appliances are, are a good distance away from other air inlets that could potentially draw that high uh, rel relative humidity back into your house. Um, next I'm going to talk about is that verification um, that happens. So the IRC 2015 and I am still you know learning about this myself. So what they have done is they've got this table here um, that is what they're calling their prescriptive duct sizing. So if you meet these requirements here for um, for your duct work then you don't have to field verify um, the uh, the exhaust um, fan itself. So, to be honest, I don't know quite how they are requiring the uh, documentation. If you have to take pictures of the ductwork or or document uh, the sizing and or is it flexible or smooth, I really don't know that specifically. This is such a new uh, a new uh, change for us that I haven't gotten specific um, instruction yet as to how they're, they're requiring this. Um, plus, if you look here, you got to deduct 15 feet for each elbow. And it's actually the same thing for termination. So if you terminate uh, you know, with a wall cap, roof cap, well, that creates static pressure as well. And you actually have to uh, deduct 15 feet for all terminations as well. So my next slide here kind of is what, what kind of sums up, you know, uh, what they're what they're looking for. So, um, if we have a product that has a performance of 80 CFMs at 0.25 inches of static pressure, and you're following that that table, uh, then your uh, your fan will meet their requirements. So you would have to provide that documentation. And it's my understanding that it applies to all um, exhausting ducts or appliances. So whether it's range hoods or uh, OTRs or bath fans, uh, where it's unclear that um, I don't know the answer to yet, I'm still looking into is HRVs and ERVs. Are they requiring the same thing for that? So if any of you actually have that answer, I would love to hear from you uh, and kind of can guide me a little bit on that. But they're using that baseline as 0.25 inches of static pressure because that's really the national average. Uh, all of the, the data and research that we've done uh, throughout the years have indicated nationally um, when they're installing our bath fans, they're going to be about 0.25 inches of static pressure. And HVI, when they're testing our fans, um, their initial test is only at 0.1. So if you look at some of our uh, economy bath fans, um, they may be 80 CFMs, um, four zones at 0.1 inches of static pressure, where we know that in most cases they're not going to be at 0.1. They're going to be at 0.25. So that's where the change is happening. And it's my understanding that if you... Um, you don't provide that documentation then if you look at my last bullet here you will need to field verify the flow rate of that fan so I guess my my understanding or, or my extra question maybe to, to Joe is or to anybody else out there is is it easier to document all of this well how many feet of duct you know is it smooth is it rigid what's your terminations or is it easier just to use your you know a flow hood or whatever to test that bath fan and document that. I mean, what is easier? Uh, so um, that's uh, something that they are now requiring with the IRC 2015. I think that I can help you with that a little bit, Jeremiah. So I think one of the things that the building officials and those of you out there that are listening can 
uh, chime in is that there, uh, if you see, uh, again, this is 2015, not actually 2012. Um, so correct. some people are still working into this, but um, in, in the future, it'll be if they see three inch flex, they'll fail you because that doesn't work. Um, so that means if they have a, a three inch port, they need to upsize immediately to a four inch. Um, and I have a feeling that most manufacturers will be probably producing fans that have four inch uh, in the near future. It's just the standard, even for the low end um, is what I'm guessing. Um, so if you do have a three inch, then you're, you're dealing with rigid and you can see the little note at the bottom uh, on the previous slide. If you want to go back to that, Jeremiah, great. Thanks. Um, that you, when you're deducting 15 feet for each elbow and some of these, uh, building officials are very savvy as to what some of this stuff is. And they understand this from ducks in general. Uh, and if you remember that, um, defect that we had a couple of slides ago where the actual flex went completely back, that's actually, um, two elbows back to back as well as they're even scrunched. So those are the kind of things that should be a, a trigger for the, um, uh, building officials and they see that that's all pre drywall type of inspection stuff. So um, I think these kind of things are, uh, we're becoming much more advanced as how our homes perform and um, many building officials are up to the task. And there are still some that for a lot of stuff, they don't care. They don't care if you do a blower door or a duct test and it's kind of sad, but uh, eventually um, people get on the same page. So um, I, th I don't think that verifying it with a performance test will be the main course. I think it'll be evaluating the install visually to confirm that though, even if it's flex, that it was run uh, reasonably straight, has a termination outside and uh, was a specific size that would have met the, uh, you know, reasonable criteria. If that helps. Yep. Thank you. Um, one thing before I move on, because my, my next few slides are going to talk more about uh, whole home mechanical ventilation, but, uh, you know, what Joe kind of led me into is some of the installation defects that are out there um, that I've seen uh, over the past few years. And a few of the things that I've, I've noticed or have, you know, had what, what I, you know, warranty calls. They, they call me up and say, hey, this fan's bad, you know, it's not working as intended, and they expect me to solve it. Some of the things that I've discovered over the years is that um, sometimes they, when the contractor's installing the ductwork to the, um, the damper, they'll actually put a screw through the ductwork to hold it tight, and then they'll they'll tape around that. Well, you wouldn't believe how many times because the damper is you know weighted down, and the contractors on a ladder below the the fan, they actually put that screw in a position where my damper will actually hit that screw and will not allow it to open up all the way. So. Basically, we're trying to jam, you know, 50, 80, 110 CFMs through a sliver of an opening versus that entire damper opening up. So that's one uh, thing that I've seen that happens more frequently than not. Um, a couple other things that I've seen uh, over the years is that the ductwork um, hasn't been securely fastened uh, to whether it's the, the beam above or whatever. Uh, it to where it starts sagging. So they might have one uh, strap every 10 feet or, or whatever that distance is. They're not close enough apart to where you start getting these, these ups and downs of the ductwork as it goes through uh, that cavity. So I've seen that a lot and that can also create to the, the static pressure issue. And then long duct runs. You know, when, when we're designing these houses, we need to be having conversations with these builders as to you know, where do you plan on realistically terminating um, these exhaust appliances? Uh, there's been quite a few high-end custom houses where they're they're adamant about having a powder bathroom near the front door. When they're entertaining guests, they don't want these guests, you know, going throughout the entire house. So they want that bath fan near and that uh, bathroom near the front door. And I ask them, well, will you plan on terminating this bath fan? That's within, you know, 20 feet or 10 feet of the front of your house, or, oh, I want to take it to the back of the house. And it's like 40 to 80 feet away, depending on how long this house is. Uh, and I just tell them that that's not realistic, that we need to plan better as to where we have our bathrooms inside of these houses so that we can 
plan to have the shortest duck runs as possible. And then when they're they're designing all of their floor plans and so forth, that they keep that into consideration. So those are a few comments I wanted to add before I, I change from uh, spot ventilation to whole home mechanical ventilation. Are there any other questions, Joe, that you have? Yeah, I got some. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of questions which I'll let let you answer when we switch uh, roles here. But um, one of which was I realized that <clears throat> there's two uh, types of um, potential listeners or people that are involved in this uh, installation. So uh, I'll just describe it as the contractor, and it may be the general contractor, the electrician, and the HVAC contractor that are installing this, and the code official that evaluates it. So my last answer was kind of more involved of can this be confirmed as compliant with the code? And uh, I follow many other responses, which is I would rather um, just measure it. So it's a lot easier just to hook up my uh, um, my measuring device and uh, my gauge and go, yes, you actually comply. And a lot of us are doing that uh, on a regular energy audit or if we're doing any kind of rating or uh, energy star, all those things are required to get measured. So um, there's two sides of it, one of which is does it look correct before drywall? And um, do we then later, many of us are now coming back and confirming, yes, you do have the correct flow <clears throat> through this device. <clears throat> Knowing that somebody didn't step on the, uh, the the duct in the attic or do something else to crush it. Um, so just want to clarify that there are two sides of the, of the story here. Yeah. Awesome. So um, let me just keep moving here then. So now we're going to move a little bit more away from your your spot ventilation bathroom fan to um, whole home mechanical ventilation. Um, as we are tightening up these homes to be more uh, airtight, more energy conscious, um, we now we're trying to provide a pathway of fresh air into these houses that we can actually control. So in order to do so, Ashray has come up with some, some tables uh, that we use uh, in reference to when it comes to how much CFM or, or fresh air we need to draw into this house now that we're not relying on Mother Nature to blow against the side of our house and change the air for us. So we're using mechanicals uh, to to draw fresh air into the house versus relying on Mother Nature to do it for us. So these are two tables depending on where you live, what what code you guys are following that ASHRAE has, has put out. So we got the ASHRAE 62.2 2010 and then the 2013. And if you let's talk about the first one a second, the 2010. So basically, what they're wanting is um, the formula includes you know one percent of the square feet of the home, and then we're taking the number of bedrooms plus one because your master typically is going to be two occupants, and we need um, that 7.5 is number of CFMs per occupant is what they're shooting for. So we're assuming that there's going to be uh, one occupant in each of the bedrooms and then we're going to have an additional occupant for that master. Uh, so that's how they're coming um, with that number there of 7.5 uh, air changes per hour for each occupant. And then that will equal our um, CFM. So if you look at my math there, so if we have you know, a 3,500 square foot house we're taking 1% of that, that's 35 um, plus if it's a four bedroom house, uh, but we have five occupants, we take that times the 7.5, gets us to 38. If we add that together, so that's 73 um, CFMs of, of air that we need to have a whole home mechanical uh, ventilator for that house. Uh, and later on, I'll talk about the different uh, ventilators that are. Um, different strategies for that. Um, so the the 2013 code uh, for ASHRAE has changed to where they want 3% versus 1% of the square feet of the house. So it does change it drastically, but what it also does is, if you see my um, comments there, infiltration credits may be taken if blower door test is conducted. So there's there's ways to bring that number down um, if if the house is actually tested and so forth. So with 
let's say let's let's assume that we're not testing the house specifically. If we do the uh, the math there on the far right uh, for the 2013 code, if we have 3,500 square feet times 3%, that's 105. Uh, and then same number of bedrooms, um, same occupants, that's still 38. So that comes to 143 CFMs um, of ventilation we need for that house. So there is a huge difference between the ASHRAE 62.2 2010 and the 2013 um, one thing I also wanted to show you that a lot of uh, manufacturers have a table that we have inside of our literature. Uh, we do as well. So this is just a generalized table to help with um, specifying products. Um, this is also an ASHRAE table, so they've actually produced this um, to where you know it kind of says, hey, if you need to generalize a, a bath fan or uh, an exhausting uh, product to bring fresh air in, this kind of gets you into the ballpark of what you need. But the the actual formula gives you more of an, of an exact number. And all of us professionals, we should be using the formula as our, as our you know, de um, determination of what we need for whole home mechanical ventilation, where these tables are used more for, you know, the sales consultants at... Uh, different distributors where they're just trying to get that homeowner into uh, you know a bath fan that is close to it um, so let's say for this you know case 3,000 I'm sorry um, 3,500 square feet um, four bedrooms so this would be 900 if you look at this chart um, so that's going to be over uh, the the 73 CFMs that we need. So we can always back that fan down. Hey, Jeremiah, can you go back to the yeah. previous slide sure. for a second? Sure. So both, I mean, of course, uh, there are several ways to <clears throat> learn a topic, <clears throat> pardon me, one of which is to do a webinar. So um, if you really want to, like, you know, get your knowledge base uh, on top of your game, do a webinar on it because you'll learn a lot. So Jeremiah and I both had to, like, double check what was on 2015 or what are some of the new changes. So uh, some of my slides kind of uh, talk about it, but the one on the bottom, which is the ASHRAE um, 2013, this is also the same one for that's in the ICC mechanical code for 2015. So it isn't whether or not you're going to follow 62.2.13. If you're following 2015, this is the actual formula, the 0 0.03 times floor area. So um, that is actually a code compliant uh, requirement once we get to 2015. Um, the other one that you'd mentioned is the uh, uh, credit that's there. And the credit, I, uh, unless somebody else can correct me also, is that's only for an existing home. So new homes, they're assuming that they're much tighter than the existing home. So existing homes are leaky so that you get this credit if it's a existing home. So that's how the credit can be applied if it's a uh, uh, you're changing out or doing a retrofit. So thanks. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, so there's different strategies that uh, are used to meet your whole home mechanical ventilation. Um, so there's supply strategy, exhaust strategy, and balance strategy. And all these strategies have different pros and cons, you know, whether it's um, the best for the structure of the house or it's the cheapest to install or it's the cheapest to, uh, to run um, and so forth. So I just wanted to go through this really quick just to show you kind of some of the strategies that are out there. So supply strategy, we're taking a, a fan and we're trying to suck air from outside in to the house and then positively pressurize the envelope of the home to where air then will leak out of the house through cracks and crevices and so forth. So I think this is the best strategy when it comes to true bringing fresh air in. But it's not the best strategy when it comes to how is that fresh air um, from inside the house pushing through the uh, materials that are inside of our home, such as the drywalls and, and the uh, cabinetry and so forth, as we're pushing some of that uh, hot or humid air that we have inside of our house, depending on how we like to live. Um, that could also lead to some condensation issues or some um, moisture issues and so forth. 
Um, so those are just some of the concerns we have with supply strategy. The exhaust strategy does exactly the opposite where we're using uh, a fan to depressurize the inside of the house to a point where we're trying to draw fresh air in through the rest of the cracks and crevices. Um, this exhaust strategy typically only works uh, when we um, are still at a kind of high um, ACH, you know, uh, because if we're down at one air changes, um, it's tough to draw fresh air into the house through the, the small cracks that are there. So this really only works as, as we are um, just beginning to learn about mechanical ventilation. Exhaust tends to be the best first strategy. Uh, because it is the cheapest way to accomplish the goal. And I'll talk about some products about this later that meet this. And then balance strategy is the best overall uh, way to, to meet your whole home mechanical ventilation because we're using two fans now. We're taking a fan that's sucking air in and a fan that's pushing air out. So it doesn't have any adverse effects on the, the structure itself. Uh, plus, as I'll talk about later, there are some other benefits uh, to balance because we can recoup some of the uh, the energy that we have spent or the money that we've spent to heat or cool uh, the inside of our home because as with the exhaust and supply, we're taking untreated air that's outside and bringing that into the house. So it could be hotter than the air we have in our, in our home or it could be colder than the air that is in our home or it could be... A, relative humidity or a lower relative humidity, most cases it's going to be something different than what we currently have inside of our house. So we then at that point using the exhaust or supply strategy we have to spend some money to re-temper or condition that air. Where the balance strategy helps us with that process. So let's go with uh, the first one I'm going to talk about here is the exhaust strategy. So this is where we use a bath fan um, that would actually uh, run continuously to depressurize the envelope of that house to draw fresh air in. So we have both single speed and multi-speed options um, that are on the market. So the single speed would just basically be if, if you have a requirement of 80 CFMs, well, this fan is an ADCFM fan that's going to run continuously. It's never going to be switched off. It's always going to be running at that ADCFMs. Um, but the likelihood of that fitting the, the mold of everybody is very unlikely. So we've got these multi-speed fans that have a module built into it, like that picture in the lower right, where we can back the, uh, the, the maximum velocity of that fan down to a specific CFM. So if that, if based off of your calculations, if we had a um, 80 CFM fan, and if we go back to the uh, formula that I was using before in the slide 14 earlier, where we've got 73 CFMs, well, we can now back that 80 CFM down to 73. Or if we have a 110 CFM fan, we can back that 110 fan down to 73 CFMs to run continuously at that 73 all day long. And then when an occupant goes into that bathroom to take a nice shower, um, they would hit their wall switch like they normally would and this product, this fan would ramp up to the maximum uh, velocity which could be 80 or 110 CFMs. What's also nice about this product um, is that it's you can adjust it in the field. So if the contractor installs this product and sets it up to be, you know, adjusted at a certain CFM and let's say there's been some a change work order or something changes to the house that that uh, the contractor wasn't told about, you know, prior or something. Well, you can always adjust this um, up and down uh, to meet those new changes. Uh, if they added a bedroom or something. The only thing we can't do is go higher than, than the uh, the maximum velocity. So if we're right at that set, like the for our example, the 73 CFMs, if we're at that 73 CFMs, we have no wiggle room there. So I have a lot of uh, home builders that are in that situation, they'll either do two 
ADCFM fans and have them combined to meet that 73, or they'll do 110 CFM fans just so that they've got some room there to adjust up or down depending on the final number, the final occupancy, how is it going to, how this house is going to perform. Because the last thing we want is to install all these great products and then it to fail or not meet the, the code that we're trying to, uh, to meet. So keep that in mind uh, when specifying a, an exhaust strategy that we want some wiggle room there um, to be able to adjust uh, these fans up or down. Another feature of uh, this particular product, our Ultra Green series, is we actually have a DC motor built into this fan. Uh, this DC motor um, allows us to, to do a couple different things. So the first thing it allows us to do is be very energy conscious. Um, we can have an 80 CFM fan running and only use 5.8 watts of energy. So it's where I would say an average bath fan, uh, because we have so many, it's tough to pinpoint which one, but an average, we average all the, the intermittent bath fans that are running right now uh, out there, um, they're probably going to be somewhere in the 40 range, maybe 50 um, so watts. So that's a huge change from you know, 50 watts at 80 CFMs down to 5.8. So I've done the, the math a few different times uh, for some presentations I've done in the past where if we were to run this product all year long, never turn it off at 80 CFMs with a, at 11 cents uh, per kilowatt, this thing probably costs about 6 to $8 a year to run at 80 CFMs. So it's very energy efficient when it comes to um, operation. Um, what this DC motor also allows us to do is we can program it to run at a specific RPMs. And why we do that is because we, this is, becomes more of a health and safety issue now because it's, it's our fresh air into the house. So we want this fan to be able to adjust for that installation like we talked about earlier. We can't guarantee that the ductwork is going to be, you know, six inch straight right out of the house, easy termination. It's going to have all those bends and turns potentially. So this particular product will compensate for static pressure. So if it has, if it starts to turn on and it's that RPM rate is slower than what is programmed inside of this fan, it will automatically adjust and speed up to make sure it delivers that required CFM. Uh, in either continuous or boost mode that is required for the, out of that fan. So if we've got a long duct run that could create more static pressure, this fan's going to spin at a higher RPM than it would on a short duct run. But as we know with physics, you've got that trade-off, right? So if we're spinning at a higher RPMs to drive that 80 CFMs, well, that fan's going to be louder. So that's uh, one of the telltale signs of is this ductwork this fan's hooked to uh, as good as it should be? If this fan's nice and quiet, that ductwork is awesome. If this fan is really loud, well, maybe there's some improvements we can do uh, to make the ductwork better, and this fan will actually indirectly tell us, you know, some of that stuff. One of the comments I got, Jeremiah, was one of the problems that if. Um, <clears throat> uh, if there is some kind of resistance and the fan can compensate, it also becomes a negative on the watt draw, um, which is something that is already monitored. And that's, um, yeah, I guess it's, it's good or good or bad, but that, that is it, when the sound goes up, you should be aware that your watt draw just went up. Correct. Absolutely. You know, because it's spinning at a higher RPM. So it's going to be consuming more energy to do that. So your watt is just going to go higher. Um, so that's absolutely a great question, and that is, in fact, the case. So if you've got long duck runs, uh, not only is that fan going to sound louder, well, it's going to cost you more to run. So it won't, at 80 CFMs, at a higher static pressure, it's not going to be 6 to $8 to run that fan. It might be you know, 8 to $10 or 8 to $15 or something like that. So absolutely. Um, there is a lot of chatter and great comments, feedbacks, um, good, bad, and indifferent about some of the installs we talked about. And um, what I wanted to recommend that I know you have a couple of slides that are coming up on um, 
whole house um, uh, systems in terms of um, uh, ERVs, HRVs. And what I want to do is just kind of shorten that discussion and we'll probably come back and have a whole one on that. I got a couple of slides to cover that uh, also, um, but there's a lot of questions here that I know that folks want to get to and I want to cover some of the testing. So if you want to um, sure. catch the next two slides, that'd be great. Yeah. I guess I just realized how long I've been talking. It's I okay. apologize. It, it, no, it's all been good. Uh, I would have shut you off earlier if I needed to. Don't. <laughs> but there's a lot of great stuff that's here. Yeah. So um, I'm going to just basically skip the, through this. Uh, this Ultra Series fan can be, you know, really quiet. It has built-in timer. It can be motion sensing, humidity sensing. Uh, then there's also the supply strategy out there. Um, ultimately, like I said earlier, this is the best strategy, you know, to bring fresh air in. Uh, but then we have to worry about, you know, how we're going to retemper it. Um, some of the areas of concern is the furnace. You know, typically the furnace is the most expensive appliance in the house. Uh, it was typically designed to recirculate and temper the air. So how is it truly, in fact, drawing air in? Uh, so ductwork installation is is everything for this system, the strategy. And then you also may be required to put an ECM motor into the air handler itself to provide it. Uh, a better energy efficiency because typically an AC motored fan uh, air handler is going to be you know 300 to 500 watts of energy so that's a supply strategy so we oh let me go back a second we currently don't have a solution that utilizes this, this supply strategy uh, because of some of those concerns so what we have done is created a hybrid between those two so we have a makeup air damper here that will communicate with a bath fan intermittently to meet your code while still providing fresh air into the house. So and it utilizes these two controllers here. So you'll have a wall switch here that's programmed to meet your ASHRAE 622 requirement of ventilation. But every time this bath fan turns on, it'll send a, send a signal to the other controller to open up that uh, air inlet to provide a pathway of fresh air into the house. So it helps. Um, helps you guys bring in the pressure that we are all requiring or wanting into our house through that damper, but still utilizing the bath fan to meet the code. So the, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. one of the, pardon me, one of the features that we talked about was this one, what I thought uh, most exciting because if you do exhaust only, the air has to come from someplace that's not always the most um, promising. So this kind of was a, I thought, a great solution. And, um, you, uh, why don't you explain how this signal runs, because um, it's not a Wi-Fi signal. Why don't you explain how this signal works? Oh, absolutely. Um, so basically, the easiest way for me to explain how this works is it uses INSEAN technology where this controller, there's one controller going to be a master controller. So if you have multiple bath fans and you want to have them all hooked up to this, this system, one of those those switches would be the master switch and all the other ones would be accessory switches that would re report back to that master switch. Well, this master switch, every time it's turned on or one of the accessory switches are turned on and communicating with it, it sends out a, a low voltage signal on the existing house wiring, uh, basically like a bunch of ones and zeros in a certain frequency and a certain pattern to where only our link logic controller, which is the other switch there, uh, will recognize that signal and then actuate to open up the, the fresh air inlet. So there's no uh, wiring required that goes from this switch to the other switch. So it makes it really easy for installation out there uh, that you're not having to worry about how am I going to get a wire from the bathrooms back to your fresh air damper. It's all done via the existing house wiring that's already there. The only things that uh, comments I want to comment on, on that is that we want to try to make sure that all of these exhausting appliances are on the same bus side. Because as you, you guys know, you got 240 coming into your house and it's split up into to two one, 120s or 110s. So we want to make sure that they're on the same side so that we don't have to run that signal all the way through another 240 volt appliance for that to come back to the, the, the panel and then go out to the, the damper. So. That's the only comment I wanted to make on, uh, on yeah, the so wiring to side. Clarify that. That would be on the same phase is basically what you're saying. So, yes. Yeah. I, I use bus as, but yeah, phase is the same thing. So, so but this, um, a lot of people were assuming that this uh, a damper, a dampener would be um, connected to the HVA system, but it does not have to be. It just is a, could be designed to 
uh, again, cold climates, not always the greatest uh, thing or hot human climates, you're bringing in air that may be a penalty. But um, in general, this does not have to connect to the HVAC system. It can just actually be a, a vent that brings air in. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, because this is just a, a motorized damper. So it's up to you, the builder, the contractor, whomever it be, to to install it in a fashion in which you choose. So it can go into HVAC system if you choose to or not. Uh, what's also nice about this damper is it's a passive system. So we're not we're not and inside of here that A would use more energy or B would possibly pressurize the house. Um, air is, you know, relatively dumb. It's going to take take the path of least resistance. So if there is another window open or a door open somewhere else in the house that the air is going to come in through anyway, well, it's going to take that path first, and this damper, even though it will be open, will sit dormant. It will, no air will be coming through it. It's only when this exhausting appliance uh, is depressurizing the envelope of the house to a degree where it's going to pull the fresh air from this damper, which I also call a motorized window. You know, we uh, too lazy to open the windows in our own house to provide fresh air, so we need to have motorized ones to do it for us and have them all working together. So this will open and close, and you can duct it any way you choose to to provide that pathway of fresh air. And some of you people are asking about filtration, and there are uh, exterior dampers that have a filter on them that are uh, multi-purpose. So. Absolutely. So you can hook up a filter box to this. You can hook it up to your HVAC system that will have a filter. So, uh, yeah, if you're worried about any sort of filtration uh, on these, this type of unit, then, yeah, you would uh, make that selection um, during the, the design phase of your, your project to either filter it or not. I have a, a couple of slides that do talk about... Um... Uh, ERVs and HRVs. So what I wanted to do is just kind of head and move you um, yep. to, into I'll the discussion while my slides are up. How about that? Absolutely. So skip that. And then the last thing I've got is just make up air dampers in, as a whole. So um, with uh, we talked about earlier about uh, kitchen range hoods where you need 400 CFMs of, uh, of make up air if you have a 400 CFM range hood um, at that one for one. Um, so this damper, this particular model here, doesn't use that link logic controller. It has a pressure switch. In this situation, you would need a low voltage wire from that exhausting appliance, in this case a range hood, to the damper, uh, in which you would uh, it would sense this pressure switch would sense the um, the air in that duct of that range hood every time it's turned on, and then it would um, actuate this damper uh, to provide, again provide a pathway of fresh air. What's also nice about our damper system is that it can perform multiple features. So you can have the same damper use the link logic controller as well as a bunch of pressure switches, as well as you could have whether a dry contact or wall switch, relay, or whatever you'd want to actuate this pathway of fresh air. So you can have essentially one fresh air inlet, uh, and then through the, the series of different controls that we offer, open and close this damper depending on what exhausting appliances is operating or requiring to um, have fresh air into the house. And uh, that is pretty much my presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab the screen and um, yep. if you can, do you have access to the questions? I'm assuming you do, yes? Let me find it. I, I know I have it here somewhere. I just I don't see it just yet. Yeah, it's on your control panel. It's a little thing that says questions, and you can hit a little uh, thing on the corner that'll pop it out, so you can actually Perfect. see them. You've got definitely got a whole bunch of questions um, that are directed towards some of your installs. So um, I'll let you take care of those. Okay, so um, I did not mention this in the beginning, so I apologize. But we uh, did try to do it on the announcement that this was a ninety-minute. Um, uh, time frame because I knew that Jeremiah would have a lot of great stuff and there'd be a lot of great questions. So uh, I apologize. I did not let people know ahead of time that this was a, a longer one. Typically we do go over, but my goal was to let people know ahead of time that, hey, we're going to go a little longer than we normally do. So um, some of the stuff may be familiar to you if you've joined this webinar in the past about exhaust fans. So that's why I wanted to give Jeremiah enough time to uh, 
to cover some of those topics and uh, get these questions answered. So um, the only webinar handout I have is not a RetroTech one. It's actually one that I found from Department of Energy that talks about the efficacy or how much watt draw um, the fan or ERV or HRV uh, has and how to calculate that. It's got a few strange concepts in it and a few uh, bad illustrations, but in general, it explains how to figure out the watt draw for compliance. And that's one of the things that does happen in 12 and 15 is you need to know what your watt draw actually is. Um, and California does this for also their uh, air handlers. So anyway, I thought this article was a simple, um, easy to follow how to figure out how much watts your system is doing. A lot of other compliance actually is just what's stated on the uh, the box itself um, for a variety of appliances. So if you want to calculate it, uh, here's one way to do it. It's not a direct measurement. It's actually just saying what's the amps, what's the volts. Now I can determine what the watts should be. We have talked about ventilation a lot, and I want to uh, send you to the place to go uh, calculate this or confirm what's 2010 versus um, 13 on the 62.2 and all the other things that have to do with um, insula, uh, v uh, ventilation. And this is residentialenergydynamics.com. Some people refer to it as RED, but again, residentialenergydynamics.com. Uh, this is a uh, free site. It's incredibly user-friendly. And if you want to know or calculate anything about ventilation, this is the place to go. It is a, a web application only, which means you've got to be on the web to do it. Uh, it's not something you can download, but um, it is a, a great resource for everybody. So um, you may have seen this at the trade shows. I made this prop for uh, Larry Zarker at BPI. Uh, he has a new Healthy Home initiative, and um, I thought this is a great way to explain that you know, uh, people talk about, well, I don't want to seal my home up too tight uh, because uh, it needs to breathe or I need to breathe. I'm like, well, do you mind breathing through your wall? So I created a wall section showing people what they may be breathing through their wall. And it goes back to Jeremiah's thing about having a damper um, that actually gives you a, a, a direct source when you're using exhaust as a, a source for your ventilation. If you have exhaust, where's that air coming from? Because air out equals air in. So uh, I always remind people that, you know, your exhaust fan takes air out, but it's bringing air in through something like this. Uh, so the 2012 code um, mostly required that um, uh, everybody be below uh, five air changes per hour. That's the majority of the, the country. So that was a compliance. So you may have local amendments that do not follow that. But in general, um, you could actually be uh, higher if you lived in the south. But right now, it's five air changes per hour for most folks. And anything below five, um, you need mechanical ventilation. And it is shocking the amount of people that do a blower door and have exactly five air changes per hour. Because if you have five, dead on five, you do not have to have mechanical ventilation. But if you are below five, you need to have mechanical ventilation. Um, most people are already doing mechanical ventilation. In 2012, didn't we have a requirement in terms of uh, how to, to comply with bedrooms and number of people? Uh, it was more of uh, bath fans are 50 CFM, uh, more of a stated um, uh rating and kitchens are 100 CFM as a stated rating and kitchens now have to go to the outside. So the code is very good about <clears throat> moving us towards better homes slowly so people can understand them and actually accept some of these new installs. So uh, that's come some of the code compliant language that's out there. Uh, Jeremiah touched on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there are three strategies. And um, exhaust creates negative pressures in the house. So if you have exhaust only and you're closing your bedroom doors, you are actually also bringing in air from outside and other sources. So again, exhaust only and having some uh, direct source for, to make up that air is a great uh, philosophy and a great uh, strategy to use. So um, supply, depending on how you use it or how it's uh, uh, used or integrated, uh, can be very effective. Um, combined with uh, exhaust, uh, it's a great system. Whether or not it's balanced or not depends on how you install your system. So one of the most common supply side is an air cycler, which is a uh, system and a special uh, uh, stat that actually will um, – allow fresh air to come in even if your uh, HVAC system uh, is not uh, active. So maybe you have days where you're not turning on uh, air conditioning or heating. It will say, oh, this hasn't come on in four hours. 
I'm going to cycle your air handler, open up a damper, and bring uh, air in from outside. I don't use the word fresh air because I have no idea where you live or what's outside. Some places may call it fresh air, but it's really just replacement air or outside air is what I really call it. So whether it's fresh or not depends on uh, your location and what your neighbors are doing. So this is a strategy. I'm going to talk later about some ways you can actually measure this. So I just wanted to mention this as a strategy or what does supply side look like. So here is actually integrating again with the HVAC system. The one that Jeremiah mentioned a minute ago could do this similar process, but actually be only a direct source to the inside. It does not have to integrate with the HVAC system. The balance one is more of an ERV or HRV, and I got some other slides. We'll kind of uh, Jeremiah can explain the uh, an ERV kind of system and uh, what is entropy and why that's effective for the South. Um, but basically, it's designed to say, okay, I'm going to bring in air from outside, and I'm going to kind of when best um, resources that it actually will run air um, near each other and uh, temper it so that it doesn't always just bring in hot uh, humid air or cold, um, dry air from outside, it actually tries to uh, temper that with your air inside. And that's why those systems are considered to be higher end. They cost more money to do that, uh, but they're much more effective and provide a much larger comfort level for everybody. Okay, so uh, I'll explain some ways that you are use our devices to measure stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk about the exhaust fan as a concept. And these are the easiest things to measure. I did a study with uh, uh, Bill Spohn and True Tech Tools a while ago where I had uh, for, uh, four or five different uh, tools that I can use to measure. And we only focus on exhaust fans because it's the easiest thing to measure. And all of them were in a fraction of each other in terms of CFM. So almost anything you use is uh, it does well with exhaust fans. So I've got a device and uh, it is able to measure the pressure and uh, that converts it to the flow. The real challenge is when you're dealing with a supply flow that's actually moving into the device. That's where things get very tricky is that your sensors don't know what to do with this air or extra air or running directly into uh, the flow sensors. So it many times will be challenged to read or can give you uh, misinformation depending on how much flow or the velocity of this uh, of the air that's moving in. So that's one of the reasons that makes these this measuring supply air much more challenging. And uh, there are a lot of even just a cardboard box can measure an exhaust fan, but it does not work for a supply register. So there's a couple ways to measure stuff. So clearly this is my device and it's a passive device and it's got a basic kind of grid or some type of uh, method to measure the amount of pressure. That pressure gets converted into a flow, but air just moves uh, directly over their uh, sensors. And uh, the other one is actually to have a powered system. A uh, powered system is actually has a fan that will match the amount of pressure that's moving through it. So it creates a zero uh, neutral pressure uh, in the middle here. It says if this fan is moving the same amount of uh, air that's on the other side, then I know exactly how much air is moving. And uh, we're going to talk about how to use your duct tester as a powered flow hood uh, as a resource because many of you have a duct tester and a gauge, and this is something that can be done fairly easy. It's a little more complicated or cumbersome than just pulling out a flow hood uh, that's powered and, and uh, putting it up there, but uh, it still can be done, and a lot of people use this as a method to measure, especially kitchen exhaust fans. Okay, so the most common way to measure exhaust fans is actually the Energy Conservatory exhaust fan flow meter. So um, if anybody out there has this, it'd be great to know what type of, uh, how, how common this is. Um, to my understanding, it's the most common tool that's used to measure exhaust fans. It clearly, it's called the exhaust fan flow meter. So, but um, many people don't know that the Retrotech gauge will um, work with any of the energy conservatory products including their exhaust fan flow meter so i'm going to go through what's on there so if you are um, using a retrotech gauge and you follow the instructions that come with the device it will not work and many people call them like oh this thing doesn't work it's because retrotech and energy conservatory have a different way of using channel b so i'm going to go through that uh, you also can make your own so um, there is information if you want to download the operation manual for the 
the 200 duck tester, it actually has this information in here about how to use a cardboard box, or you can go to the container store or your uh, hardware store and just get a plastic container and cut a hole. Uh, my advice would be something that's around four by six is the most common hole. And um, depending on what method you use with the, uh, the RetroTech system is you can actually tape that off or make it smaller or cut it a little larger if you need to, because there's a method in the gauge to allow you to determine the hole that you make in your own device uh, that'll measure the flow. So here again, the big difference between Energy Conservatory and RetroTech in terms of how their gauges function is that Energy Conservatory uses the input to connect to its devices. All right, so if you're going to connect the input uh, on on uh, channel B here to the fans or to a variety of devices, RetroTech is the opposite. They use the reference uh, to do that. So they have other ways that they uh, calculate uh, subtracting um, things that are come from the input. So you can actually do things with the blower door that are automatic and not have to add extra tubing. So again, we're going to use the reference to connect to devices. The most common way to remember that is, is for RetroTech, it's a yellow tube and it usually goes to the yellow fans. Or anything that would go to a fan would go to any kind of device on channel B is one way to keep track of that. So we've got our energy conservatory exhaust and flow meter and we connect the, the reference, not to the input. So um, now I'm able to actually use it. And there are settings. I'll go through quickly on how to set the gauge up. So um, on the gauge itself, you'll tap on the icon that has the fan or whatever you may have there in the middle on channel B. And uh, what you're going to do is at the bottom, you'll change device. Uh, that brings up uh, a series of um, uh, different pages so I can move through and find the, the TC devices and, and pick the exhaust flow meter. And just like our exhaust fans or duct testers, they all have ranges. This device also has the same. So whether you're using Energy Conservatory or um, RetroTech uh, gauges, you must select the actual range that you get on the device. It's basically a little slider that moves in and out, and the little uh, snap way that it locks tells you which uh, opening you have. The thing to, that's confusing is that uh, E1, the smaller number, is actually the larger opening. So sometimes it's a little confusing, but that's just how it is. So make sure you get your device working with the same way your gauge is, no matter what gauge you're going to use. So now I actually have the E2 opening, and now I can actually connect the gauge. And whether you use Energy Conservatory or RetroTech, I do recommend this method of actually uh, connecting both sides of the gauge to the device so you can actually read it. And I'll explain why. So here I actually get a reading. So I'm like, okay, I have the fan is running. I'm on the, uh, the reference. Um, notice that the channel A is not connected, so I have no reading. The only thing I'm actually getting is what's on channel B. It says that, okay, you have 52 CFMs, and um, what you don't know is the amount of pressure that moves through the gauge in order to make that calculation on channel B. So that's one of the things that's always kind of a mystery. So there is um, information in their guidelines that you really should be uh, above one and not above eight in terms of your pressure. So one of the things you can do is actually connect both sides of the gauge, the input, no matter which uh, gauge you use, um, and the proper side for the device on channel B. And now I can actually see that my pressure is above one and less than eight in order to know that my readings are considered to be accurate. If you're off, then you need to change the range or change the settings on the exhaust fan uh, flow meter. Uh, to either open or close the device accordingly. So it looks uh, like so. The way I actually have a T that goes to it, and I connect the the device uh, to the reference and the input, and now I'm actually reading both at the same time. So again, no matter what gauge you use, this is definitely something that I recommend that you uh, uh, how you run your uh, and operate this. One of the things that the register gauge has, and it's a really cool feature, is it has something that's called hole flow. So instead of picking one of the energy conservatory devices, you go to the next screen, and it's got this little icon that says hole flow. And when you click on it, it asks you how big is the hole on your device. So here I did a cardboard box. My hole was too small. I realized after I made it that the hole could be bigger. So let's say that this hole was uh, three by four. Right, so I would put in 12 square inches. You can do square inches or square feet in terms of how big the opening is. And then I set up my um, 
tubing the same way I did on the exhaust fan flow meter. That I basically I combined them, and there's one tube going into uh, the corner somewhere off to the side, so it's not in the direct flow. And then I can measure the same uh, flow that's happening on the uh, exhaust fan or a variety of other devices. So it's a really cool feature that's built into the gauge to allow you to do some creative stuff. Especially if you have a um, a range hood that is you know, over an island or someplace that's not easily measured with one of the other devices or other methods we'll talk about, is that I can actually get a cardboard box, cut an opening, and um, connect the gauge uh, in the same manner as I did otherwise, making sure that your connection inside here is not in the flow directly. Okay, so if it's in the flow, it's going to give you, you know, uh, readings that jump around or not be stable. So I want to make sure that um, that my reading here, I usually use a static pressure probe and push it off to the side and uh, tape it off in the corner so it stays there. So here's one way to actually do this. And one of the things that is in the code now is that if your a kitchen exhaust fan is over 400 CFM, and that's usually just a stated uh, thing off the box, then I do need makeup air. And the makeup air is supposed to equal whatever your uh, exhaust fan is. So if you've got a 600, 800, there's 1,200 CFM exhaust fans out there. Um, so then I should have the same amount of air coming in once I'm over 400, and that's in the 2015 code. It's just a good uh, – uh, practice in general to have something like that when you get those high of uh, pressures. So, um, you know, you're almost at a, uh, you know, a quarter ton or uh, of, uh, of air movement when you're kind of dealing with some of those, or you could be up to an entire ton of air movement um, based upon those, uh, those kind of numbers. One of the things that I was wondering, so here's one of my questions. So how many of you that do pressure pan tests, this is with the blower door on, all right. Uh, actually, check exhaust fans. So uh, people are like, well, what's that do? That tells me whether or not the dampers are wide open right now, and that I'm actually getting air through this fan when I should not be, because I'm actually depressurizing. So it should be pulling both dampers uh, tight up against the outside of the house and up against the, the exhaust fan. So if I'm getting larger numbers, so if I may get some small fraction of a Pascal as my reading through the pressure pan, uh, that's kind of just normal um, background uh, pressure. But if I'm getting, you know, two or three Pascals, uh, I've got a damper that's uh, really probably two dampers that are not staying closed. And so now I have a direct connection to the outside. Um, so, you know, I want to remind people if you're doing that, that's great. And um, some people don't have the special covers or special solutions for that. So when you go around with your pressure pan, next time make sure you check your exhaust fans as uh, something to also check. So I'm going to go into how to use your duct tester as a powered flow hood. Um, again, there are a lot of people that are using engine conservatory. It works both ways, so the concept is the same. Uh, Retrofit does make this um, uh, powered flow hood device, which works directly with the flange um, that you use normally for your duct tester. So it's basically a huge hood that allows you to um, cover the either the supply or return, and we're basically going to do a pressure matching type of a scenario, right? So and that's actually the hood itself. You can now see all by itself on the bottom there and, the, and how big it is in proportion to the duct tester itself. So here's the methodology that's behind it. Is your duct tester should be moving air the same direction as whatever it is you're measuring. So we're focused on exhaust fans. So exhaust fans are moving air uh, from the interior to the outside. So my duct tester should be moving air into the exhaust fan. So making sure I'm going the same way. If for some reason I was measuring a supply uh, and air is coming at the duct tester, I need to turn the duct tester around so it's moving air again in the same direction as whatever the air is you're trying to measure. So once the exhaust fan is on, I'm going to get negative pressures inside of my uh, duct tester because it's clearly the exhaust fan is directly connected to this, and it's just pulling air through my duct tester, right? And right now it's off. There's nothing on at all on the duct tester itself. So I can either set the gauge to zero. It's easier just to use the knob on the uh, the exhaust fan, uh, on the on the uh, duct tester itself to do this. It's it's the most uh, stable way to pull this off. Once the, as you can see that, let's say my exhaust fan is moving, um, you know, 75 CFMs. It's a nice heavy duty exhaust fan. 
once I have my duct tester and I start to dial it in and add pressure into it, once I have zero pressure in between the duct tester and the exhaust fan, I now know that they're both moving the same amount of air because there's zero pressure between them. If for some reason I had a positive pressure, then I'm moving too much air and I need to back off the duct tester. If I uh, have a negative number, that means that I'm not moving enough air. So once I really have this as close as I can to zero, then I can look at my gauge and go, ah, it's moving 73 pascals or 73 CFM. And I can now um, confirm the compliance. So it allows you to use this for any kind of flow measurement that you want. And this is a direct powered flow hood um, that you can do. And you've already owned this product is why this is so valuable. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through it again. I, I feel sometimes I explain it, and if I can figure out another visual to do that, you can see that. So once the exhaust fan's on, you're going to see that there's a negative pressure again that's being pulled through the gauge. So here I've got it with the gauge showing up, and I adjust until it's zero. And on channel B, I will actually get my uh, CFM reading. Uh, and make sure that you have the right device is also here because this is what determines the flow. So I can't have this on a blower door or some other device. This device and the range must match whatever duct tester I'm using. Uh, this can be done with a blower door in terms of using it on an air handler. That's a common method in California. But for exhaust fans or supply, uh, your duct tester uh, can easily measure and match those types of flows and uh, give you some accurate readings uh, to do this. So here's a, another method that's going to, it's got a large box. Uh, he's got his tube. It depends on what the other side of this box looks like. I probably would have put the tube near the bottom. Usually I actually will encase it in some Velcro so that it stays in place, has the ability to get pressure, um, but stays away from the flows that can happen in these kinds of environments. So the kitchen exhaust fan is a challenge. So here's my question I usually ask when I do this kind of thing. How many of you measure kitchen exhaust fans? So it's not uh, the most common response I get. Some people say, yes, I do. And if you say, yeah, I do, then let me know what's your method for uh, measuring the kitchen exhaust fan because it's clearly a challenge due to its height over the, uh, the stove. Um, so – and microwaves can be – have different difficulties because sometimes like in this example, they have a split exhaust intake. So there's one fan, two ways to get to it, <clears throat> and uh, – other exhaust fans may stick out further from the wall. Most of what I'm going to focus on is the most common basic microwave, basic hood that you might have over your, uh, your range or your uh, oven. So this is the most common one we're going to refer to for the next few seconds. So this is not the way to do this, which is to cover one side and expect that you'll get a, a correct flow that moves through that. Um, you must be able to measure them both at the same time in order to get an accurate measurement. So here's one of the things that I had made um, a while ago and works really well, especially for most microwaves. I'll give you the dimensions. I didn't put it on this slide. I apologize. But it's just under 30 inches wide. So this length here is just about 30 inches. That's that's incredibly common standard install for microwaves and hoods. I did just slightly under 30 because um, I want to make sure it fits and I don't crack it. And uh, the depth is 12 inches because that uh, usually covers, again, probably nine out of 10 microwaves. It doesn't work on exhaust hoods because they stick out a little bit. So I usually just use a piece of cardboard and cover it. Um, and it's about three inches tall, four inches would be fine. So somewhere between three to four inches tall. Instead of having a circle, I changed this to a square on the inside. So I now have a square that I can adjust the size if I wanted to. And once I put this on the bottom of the microwave, which is incredibly lightweight, I just tape it in place. It kind of sticks with some little bit of friction. Now I can either use a duct tester as a powered flow hood. I can use other powered flow hoods. The uh, RetroTech one is incredibly small and short, so I can use it. Or I can now use the exhaust and flow meter as a source to measure the kitchen. So again, here's again here's an example of what it looks like. Um, and off in the corner here, you can see in the bottom how what I did with the um, uh, the static pressure probe. I kind of moved it off in the corner. Uh, now I actually, again, use Velcro on both sides to kind of hold it in place and allow the pressure to move. And um, the next slide shows a way to use your um, duct tester with the uh, this type of device. And so now it's actually capturing both flows that are inside of the, the microwave. 
So again, I just made sure that the you can see right here the blue uh, pressure port, and um, the the B side is actually going to the fan, and um, uh, does everything that it needs to in terms of measuring the flow. And A side is just my pressure that I want to make sure I get to a zero pressure flow. So again, you can use other devices once I have this one container that actually holds uh, and restricts that. I don't have a lot of um, details on this. I just thought that I'd let you know that again, Residential Energy Dynamics has a great little pitot tube airflow um, uh, I guess it's a, an app or a window on there that you can actually use to do this. So there is one way to measure this with a pitot tube. You can also use a, uh, a hot wire to measure some of these flows that may be challenging on some hoods. Uh, but I do want to go back to the, um, the HVAC system that deals with the supply here. So this is the most common question. How do I measure the supply here? So one method is to use a pitot tube. It's challenging to get to and can be uh, difficult. You can also measure it from the outside. We'll, I'll give you an example of how that looks. Um, another one that will become incredibly common uh, method of measuring uh, exhaust systems and uh, supply and various other things will be the averaging flow sensor. So if you want to Google averaging flow sensor, <clears throat> there's a couple of different manufacturers, a couple of different models that are out there. The ones I have here are um, uh, very economical and uh, simple uh, system, and they're based on the depth. They actually, you have to know how, um, what's the diameter of what you're measuring because they make one for each one. So they make one for a four, a six, a five. Sometimes the five and six can be worked together. Um, but if you have an eight inch, that's different from the six inch. So you have to get the exact uh, flow sensor based upon the dimensions or the depth of your, uh, of your, uh, the duct that you're actually measuring. Uh, this is going to be coming a uh, more standard for the uh, the systems that go along with uh, in terms of measuring stuff for ResNet and also Energy Star. So um, as soon as the new um, release for the 380 is uh, is done and accepted and out there, we're going to have definitely a, uh, a webinar on how to do some of these measurements and how they'll work on the gauge and how to set up some of those uh, those devices. So we do have a thing on ERVs and HRVs. I, this slide just kind of illustrated how air moves through um, one side, gets uh, conditioned, and goes to the other side. So uh, here you can imagine that um, uh, over here I'm outside. So this line would be uh, I'm outside. Oops, don't do that. And uh, inside, so that basically as the air moves through the filtration system, it is kind of as a weave that allows uh, cold air to become warm or warm air to become cooler. And there are different uh, ways to deal with this. Um, an ERV is an a energy re recovering ventilator. And I'll let Jeremiah chime back in here on how that uh, works. I got a slide that kind of illustrates that. Uh, Jeremiah, do you want to explain the, the entropy recovery and how that actually works with the filter? Absolutely. So basically the difference between an ERV and an HRV is that the energy recovery ventilator uh, allows moisture to wick between the streams and the way we're able to accomplish that is because the, uh, the core, the materials of that core allow that wicking process to happen where the HRV core uh, is more of a rigid, harder plastic where the moisture just flies right through the core. Uh, and doesn't allow uh, that wicking uh, to happen. So uh, where both units will allow you to uh, recover your some temperature, percentage of that temperature, uh, because the core itself uh, finds like a happy medium uh, between the, the two temperatures, the outside and the inside, where the ERV through that core allows that moisture to, to slide between streams, because the idea is we don't want that the air to contaminate, you know, have that cross-contamination, so they're like individual little shoots that this air flies through, uh, both going both directions, but there's no contamination. So then we're able to then have that wicking of moisture between the streams, and that's really the main difference between the ERV and the HRV. So uh, an ERV must have a, uh, a condensate drain, obviously. Does a, a heat recovery one have a condensate drain? So, um, absolutely. So the 
ERV has to have a condensate drain where the HRV does not because you're just getting it out of the house as quickly as possible um, or in the house. So, yes. So that's uh, definitely something you want to consider if you're adding this or install or um, doing compliance. If you wanted to check the flow, you also should be confirming that you know where the condensate drain goes and uh, how that's installed um, in some place where people can confirm, like other condensate drains, do I know if it's clogged? So. Okay, so a couple of quick ways to measure or balance uh, ERVs and HRVs, and some of the most difficult ones are when they are um, have these funky uh, covers on them. So I have air in and air out, um, and it's a little very difficult or challenging. You got to make your own cardboard covers. If you do this regularly and use the same ones, then clearly you can reuse this. But somewhere I'm actually have to figure out a way to measure um, both sides of these and uh, make sure I'm not restricting the flow as I do that also. So the best way to measure something like this is to figure out a rig that does allow your duct tester to do it. And the reason that that is is because it doesn't create any kind of resistance. Many of these other passive ways of measuring uh, create resistance, as well as something like the exhaust fan flow meter uh, cannot measure the supply side or the, the, the intakes. Uh, it can measure the intake. It cannot measure the, the supply on the other side. So it cannot measure the dark blue because it cannot take pressure into it. So uh, you can measure one side with uh, exhaust and flow meter, but not necessarily not the other. Many manufacturers realize that people want to balance this and measure this, and so they've come up with uh, 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 different ports. So here's one that somebody's used on the outside. This comes from uh, Greg LeBay uh, up in Canada, uh, Blue Green. So he has the um, uh, flow finder and uh, stole his son's, um, I think, sleeping bag and uh, rigged up something with some cardboard to compensate for the siding. And he's able to measure the flow that's happening on the uh, outside here. So that's the easiest way to do that for his system that he has. They do a lot of ERVs and HRVs. So uh, again, it's a great uh, field example of what they had to do to rig up uh, the ability to measure the, uh, the output. Uh, a lot of manufacturers are getting smart. So this comes from Paul Raymer and um, the ones at Jeremiah and uh, you know, they acquired Venmar. And uh, so their ERVs and HRVs also have balancing ports. So this is one method that I can determine that I'm connected. So again, remember our cross section that things are moving kind of in an X fashion across it. So what we're doing is we want to measure the resistance uh, as air moves from one side to the other uh, in this fashion. So I can tell that I have, and again, you got to make sure your gauge is set up for Pascal and Pascal because that's what I'm measuring. There is a little grid on here that you can see that I can calculate this in inches of water column into CFM. But my goal is, first of all, to find out that I'm balanced. So another way to do that would be, okay, I can measure channel A. I can connect the other one to channel B. And there are little um, screws that adjust the dampers. So I started with dampers wide open. Um, and now I can actually start to tweak the dampers until they're both the same numbers on the gauge at the same time. So uh, this is why uh, our type of gauges that we, we work with are much more efficient than the Magnahelix because you got to keep switching them and they got to be balanced and a variety of other issues with zeroing. So here I can actually connect them both together and see what I'm doing in terms of making sure I have a balanced system um, in terms of pressure. And um, it also is recommended you check your flows to make sure that there is nothing else that's a restriction um, that may not have actually showed up in your pressures. But this is the common way to confirm that I at least have a balanced system. Um, so my last slide here, um, I believe, yep, last slide, was uh, uh, some common defects and recommendations. Uh, Jeremiah's been probably answering questions in the background. Um, so uh, someone did say that some HRVs do have a condensate drain, so uh, it may not be limited to just ERVs. Um, well, let, me, let me comment on that really quick, if, yeah, if I may. So, um, yeah, there are some HRVs that do have a condensate drain because that they have a defrost cycle. So up in the cold climates where that core may freeze up, uh, there is a, a run cycle where it just will recirculate the, uh, the inside air through that core um, to allow that core to defrost and allow air to actually start passing through again. And in those units, there will, there will be a, uh, a drain to get rid of that moisture. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. So th this is my last slide. So the one defect that I have seen more often than not is the one on the right where they do not remove this and you realize that you have a 
complete uh, scenario installed with this piece of tape holding your damper closed. Jeremiah mentioned the screw earlier. That's also a common defect. But um, one of the things that I uh, preach to people is that this tape and this r little uh, tab um, should be removed and put on the inside of the fan so that other people can see that it was removed. Um, so I can de determine that when I'm uh, later, I can go, oh, yes, I, this was a uh, checks and balance or quality assurance uh, measure is that this was removed and I see that it was placed on the inside when I go to put the motor in. So um, simple stuff like that can actually make a big difference on uh, having to cut drywall or take the whole thing apart while it's already installed. I did ask Jeremiah to give a few, uh, we did talk about some common defects, but some recommendations for the, the testers out here or contractors as to, you know, what are some of the, you know, good fan solutions, why cheaper is really not better, or some, what he recommended as the best ventilation strategy or method. Um, so, yeah, there is, a, as, as you know, with, with ventilating products, um, quality is everything. So it's not always the most uh, cheapest way to uh, to uh, meet the the strategy is not the best quality way way of doing it. So we've tried to create kind of both. Where we're trying to keep you know value engineer all of our products to where we have multiple different uh, um, features and benefits for you guys to have. So one of the things that we've done is like this for example. See that little damper there that's taped off. We'll see there's a lot of gaps around there, and that allows for a lot of air infiltration. Uh, so what we've done is, in our new Invent series line, we've created a new damper that seals up almost all the way. So if the house is under a, uh, a negative pressure, and when you're doing your, your testing at 50 pascals, you, you won't have air infiltration through our dampers, and we don't... Uh, it's not an added cost, it's just a, a way that we've dis redesigned our damper to be more efficient. So there's things like that that we've done uh, to help uh, you guys you know, test better, to have better quality products while not having the most expensive. Um, obviously the, the the best way of bringing air into your house um, for whole home mechanical ventilation would be that balance strategy, but it's also the most expensive. Uh, where the exhaust strategy ideally is the cheapest, but not the best way. So, um, other things that we uh, we need to do that are better. So, um, insulated ducts. You know, there if you look for that, that through there as well, that's up on the screen. That is a non-insulated uh, duct line. Um, so, what can happen sometimes if that roof cap or wall cap doesn't close all the way? is you're going to have cold air coming down that ductwork and sitting at that damper that I just explained that closes off all the way. Well, as soon as the occupant turns on that bath fan, uh, where you have that warm, moist air and the cold air in that duct, you could have some condensation uh, or some water dripping through there. Um, so if we insulate it, then we're able to keep it, kind of keep it uh, a little bit warmer, potentially. So insulated ducts are better. Um, and also, we had talked about previously um, soffit vents. You know, termination is everything. How do we terminate it? We want to make sure that termination is the best quality uh, that we can. So um, definitely, when um, you're choosing um, your termination point, be uh, be willing to spend uh, you know a little bit more money on a better quality termination, just because that's your first line of defense. You know, that's on the outside of your house. It's gonna be the 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 termination that closes that ductwork from the, uh, you know, from the outside, uh, and not rely on just the the damper on the bath fan to uh, to prevent that back drafting. Um, those are a couple of suggestions I had written down here for uh, for you guys to, to think about. Well, this was uh, one of our, uh, without question, one of our best webinars. So a lot of great information that went beyond what I normally preach about in terms of testing or how to use some of the devices. So I think a lot of people came back just to hear what you had, Jeremiah. And it was great information. I can tell by the questions. So um, Jeremiah will get a list of all your questions uh, that he couldn't answer today and uh, find some time probably over his uh, next couple weeks or something to respond to some of them. And, uh, oh, Jeremiah, can I give your um, uh, email out? Is that something you're comfortable with? Your Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, my email address is just my, my first name with a dot and my last name. 
so uh, at Brown Dash Newtone. So I don't I have no problems uh, answering anybody and everybody's questions via email. If you look at your question panel, I just responded to one of the last questions, and you can see Jeremiah's email there. You can should be able to copy it and paste it if you need to. And uh, he's a, he's a great resource. Um, obviously. So um, he's also uh, open to any suggestions you have or if you're having install problems or uh, suggestions about making uh, you know the process better, smoother, simpler, or whatever, um, don't hesitate to send him some uh, feedback. He, uh, he has direct connections to take that up the chain. So uh, that's why I try to reach out and have a good relationship with him because uh, uh, they actually want to make it better for everybody and they do. So all the feedback I've given him, he's actually been moving up the chain to see if they can alter a few of their uh, their install procedures. Um, thanks for all those who hung in even longer than our 90 minutes. So uh, I thought this was a, a great session. I didn't feel like we should cut it off too early. Um, and uh, the BPI stuff will be submitted uh, probably within about a week or so. And uh, we're hoping this will probably be up uh, maybe late next week. And uh, it'll be on the Retrotech site. Um, any last questions or anything else you want to do? So I'm going to say, uh, again, it's officially over. So for those of you that need to uh, uh, step on and go back to your lives, we appreciate your time. Uh, what we'll probably do is uh, do a few more questions here and let uh, Jeremiah answer some of them. So don't feel as though you need to hang out, uh, but you're welcome to. And uh, if you have any other questions, shoot those out real quick. And uh, again, thanks for all your feedback. So usually what I do, Jeremiah, is I kind of like hang out for a little bit. Some people hang out with us and uh, try and answer some of the questions if you want that are on here. Um, either type them back or you can take them uh, uh, verbally and just kind of give some information if you want. Yeah, I've been trying to answer as many as I can uh, down the, the list already. So, um, so yeah, I, I can definitely hang out for you know another 15 minutes or so. Uh, someone asked, where do you get the little T fittings to combine the uh, the tubing? And um, uh, Lowe's, any of your hardware store usually these have these, um, Home Depot. And um, usually they have a little places, uh, a little fitting section, but also wherever you also have the your uh, sprinkler or garden section, you may also find these little T's. Um, but usually they have that uh, the rack of hardware. And if you keep searching, you'll find these little creative uh, things that – have uh, T's. It's also in the plumbing section. Uh, you also can find these little T's, and uh, it's quarter-inch tubing, and uh, it's easy to uh, to find it more clearly. You can ask somebody there, as I have to do, saying, "Okay, where is this?" Um, and uh, they'll ask somebody else, and eventually you'll find it. So, uh, somebody asked some other questions, which we kind of get these. It's fine. So, someone asked, "What R value uh, should the ducts be insulated to?" Um, it depends on your climate zone, obviously, and uh, the mechanical code covers that specifically. Um, yeah, unless you know, Jeremiah, uh, what you have to insulate your um, your ducts to uh, based on climate zone. I think they're dealing with trying to avoid condensation issues for northern uh, uh, northern climates. Do you know? Uh, I would assume it's an R. I don't know off the top of my head, um, but uh, I'm I'm thinking somewhere just like just like an R three R five something really just thin. Um, but I'd have to actually look that up myself. But I think it's uh, just something to help uh, prevent that condensation. Yeah, Andrew here says uh, R8 for New Jersey. Hmm. So, um, and so I, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know if he's referring to um, the so – maybe referring to this exact type of exhaust, but that's uh, R8 also for this uh, – for duct system itself, so – I'm going to send all of these questions that you've got uh, over to uh, Jeremiah, like I said, and he'll um, you know, uh, respond as he can to you because your emails and everything show up as uh, in an Excel spreadsheet that we download. Um, so otherwise, it would take quite a while to get here. And uh, you have Jeremiah's email. If for some reason your question uh, didn't get a response to, don't hesitate to reach back out to him. And uh, I want to say thank you so much, Jeremiah, for uh, joining us today. I felt it was an awesome resource, and he'll be back. We're going to talk about more about ERVs and HRVs toward the end of the summer and uh, how to do uh, testing for the ResNet 380 and a variety of stuff as the year goes by. So 
Um, I'm going to call it a day. Everybody have a great day. And uh, we'll – oh, what's coming up next is right now I don't know. So we're trying to figure out what our July webinars are. If you've got any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Um, but usually we kind of like slow down a little bit in the summer uh, and pick back up in September. So if there's any topic you're looking for, uh, shoot it out. And uh, we'll probably do something on the gauge uh, overview and um, – uh, maybe something on commercial duct testing. So if you're looking for a specific topic, uh, send us an email. Uh, support at retrotech.com is the easiest one to do without going through sales. So, all right. Everybody have a great day. Uh, thanks so much. We'll uh, see you on the next time. Take care.